Okay, class. So I'm not here this Friday, so hopefully you're watching this ahead of time. Um, the TAs will be performing some really helpful examples on Friday. So go ahead and come to class because they're going to work through really uh, two kind of nasty problems that I think that you would like to see worked out. Um, okay. So the learning objectives for today. We didn't quite finish um, a calculation of how to figure out the largest flaw size tolerable for some sort of fatigue survival condition. So we'll start with that. And then we're going to turn our attention to the phenomenon known as creep in material science, which is time-dependent plastic deformation. We'll then uh, predict deformation from steady state creep strain rates. And at the end of this lecture today, we'll go over accelerated testing using something called the Larson Miller parameter, which is pretty slick. Okay? So let's start with this one. We won't do an actual clicker activity, but instead just follow along. The example question says the following. A steel plate has a fracture toughness of 80 megapascal root meters, and it's alternatively loaded in tension to 500 megapascals and in compression to 60 megapascals. So it's swinging between positive 500, negative 60, right? It says if A is given and N is given, then what is the largest tolerable surface flaw? So surface, right? Key thing to note there. Not internal, but surface. Uh, if the component is going to survive 10 years, being cycled once every five minutes, okay? So how do you go about even beginning a problem like this? Well, I've given you this equation to start with, right? To figure this out, what are we even being asked? It says, what's the largest tolerable surface flaw, right? So that's going to be the largest initial flaw because the flaw is going to grow over time, okay? So in other words, we're being asked to solve for this guy right here, A naught. We're being asked to solve for A naught, and we're told that it's being used for 10 years, cycled once every five minutes. So we can figure out the total number of cycles from that, and we'll do that in a moment. We are given a fracture toughness. We're given the, the uh, range and stress. So if you look through here, we're given A, we're given a range of stress, we're given N, we're given, um, since we're not told what Y is, we can assume that it's just equal to 1.12. Um, we're being asked to solve for that, but we're not given AC, so we're going to have to solve for AC first. So how do you solve for AC? Well, we're given the fracture toughness, right? So if K1C is equal to Y sigma root, uh, square root of pi times A, we know that at the maximum stress, when this is equal to its maximum, that's when the thing's going to break then we can set that to the critical flaw size, right? The largest flaw size that it can have before the right-hand side of this equation is larger than the fracture toughness and it fractures, right? So let's go ahead and solve for that. We plug in things for this. 1.12 multiplied by, that's 500 megapascals. I'm leaving it in megapascals because on the left-hand side, Fracture toughness is given in megapascal root meters, so we have the correct units. Um, why am I using 500 instead of something else? Because it's going to break at the highest tensile load that it experiences, right? It's going to cycle, but when it does break, it's going to be at that top of the cycle when it breaks. Now we multiply that by square root of pi AC. We set this whole thing equal to 80 megapascals root meters on this side, and we can solve for the critical crack length. When I plug it into my calculator, I find that A sub C, our critical crack size, is equal to, in meters, 0 0.00649. 0 0.00649 meters, okay? That's the biggest our crack can get. Um, now, now we know AC, we're being asked to solve for A naught, and we're, we know everything else. Let's go ahead and solve for NF real quick. If this thing's going to be used for 10 years, cycled once every five minutes, we can solve for that. NF is then going to be equal to 10 years. And in a year, there are 365 days. Uh, let's put that in the numerator so it cancels out. In one year, 365 days. In one day, there are 24 hours. In one hour, there are 60 minutes, and we're cycling it. Um, let's see. We are cycling this 
every five minutes. So every five minutes, there's one cycle. So if we multiply all that out, that's going to give us the number of cycles total that it needs to survive. So let's punch those into a calculator. And I get that we have 1.05 times 10 to the 6 cycles. Or in other words, this thing needs to last 1,050,000 cycles. Okay? So now we can go ahead and plug this into our crack growth equation. Okay? Let's do that. 1.05 times 10 to the 6th cycles has to be equal to 1 divided by 1.62 times 10 to the negative 12th times pi, and that's raised to the 3.2 divided by 2, right, because that was pi over 2, or n over 2, excuse me, and n is 3.2 multiplied by our range and stress, which is going to be 500 megapascals to the 3.2. Now, why is it not 560, since it ranges from positive 560 down to negative 60? The reason it's not 560 is because we ignore all the compressive part. We only look at the tensile part. And for crack growth in this class, we're assuming that no cracks grow under compression, which, again, is an assumption. And it's going to be an okay assumption for some things, and it's going to fail for others. Okay? Then we've got the integral. We're going to integrate from A0, which we're going to eventually solve for, all the way up to, we're going to put this in meters, 0 0.00649. Okay? And that's in meters. The integral is dA over 1.12 raised to the 3.2 power multiplied by a to the 3.2 divided by 2, or 1.6. So we're almost there. Uh, that was honestly, half the battle is just figuring out what all those initial units are. Let's go ahead and collapse everything out in front into one number just to make it easier. Okay. So this is all going to be equal to 228.2. And then the integral, if you can't remember how to take these integrals, you're going to want to look it up again. This is a to the 1.6. So when we take the integral, it's going to go from 1.6 to minus 1. It's going to be to the 0 0.6. So the, the integral is going to be negative 1.159 divided by a to the 0 0.6. So where did this negative 1.159 come from? We plugged in one point. 1, 2, we raised it to 3.2 power, and we multiplied that by 1 over 0 0.6, right? That's what gives this number, negative 0 0.6, excuse me, right? We're going to evaluate that integral from A0 all the way up to 0 0.00642 meters, okay? So now we can go ahead and plug in this number in for A, and then we plug in this number and we subtract the two. Let's go ahead and do so. This is equal to 264.66 divided by A0 to the 0 0.6 power minus 5,436.8, right? Equals the 1.05 times 10 to the sixth. Solving for A0 we find that A0 is equal to 9.97 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. So the biggest flaw that we can have is that size. Any bigger, and after the million cycles that we need it to survive, million fifty thousand, it will be larger than this critical flaw size, and it will break before it's supposed to. So that's how you go about using what we learned about in last class, which is this really interesting uh, way to model crack growth using A and N, the exponential crack growth constants, um, in a sort of real life problem. Okay? Obviously, we could work this many other ways. Instead of giving you the number of cycles and, ask, and asking you to solve for the initial flaw size, maybe I could give you the initial flaw size, and I could say um, how many f cycles until it breaks, right? 
Um, or I could say it, it survives this many f cycles, it went from this size to that size, what was the fracture toughness? And you could figure out the fracture toughness just by plugging in the largest loss size here, right? Maybe I could ask you to solve for what the, the stress range must have been to cause this thing to, to break when it did. So lots of different ways to ask uh, questions about this, okay? You will get some examples of how to do this on your homework this week. All right, and uh, as always, there's lots of solutions worked out on, on YouTube you can check out that I've put up there. Or come by office hours and I can talk more about it. Okay? Um, I think in last class we already talked about how to read and use log plots. Again, just one more time. Notice that these go from 10 to 100 to 1,000. So they're increasing by orders of magnitude, by factors of 10 each time. And if that's 10 down here, that's 10. That makes this 20, 30, 40 and so forth, all the way up to 90, then 100, then this would be 200, 300, and so forth, okay? Same thing over here, now it went down to 0 0.1 on the x-axis. 0 0.1, this would be 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, all the way up to 1, and then 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's how, to, how you read those. That's going to be important, um, possibly on the midterm, and maybe on the homework, I can't remember what we put on there. All right, so other factors that can af affect fatigue life. Um, there's the mean stress, right, as opposed to if it's oscillating about zero, your mean stress. Obviously, a higher stress is going to be a lower fatigue life because it's going to spend more time at a higher stress. Um, surface effects, like sharp corners and things like that, are going to be spots where cracks can start, so they're going to lower your fatigue life. You can do surface treatments. For example, um, if you machine a surface, if you put it on like sandpaper and you're polishing it, you might think that you're making it better because you're polishing it. But in fact, sandpaper, what's that doing? It's just scratching your surface, right? Now, if you're doing sanding right, then you start by introducing big scratches at the surface because you're using your low grit paper, so the really gritty stuff, the really no, low number. And then you increasingly move to smaller and smaller grit by going to higher numbers, right? So it's getting smaller and smaller, the, the scratches. So hopefully you're removing any big scratches you put in when you initially scraped it, and it's getting smoother and smoother. And if you do that, then you can get a really nice polish that will enhance the life of the material because you remove surface flaws. Um, you can do something really cool called shot peening. And maybe if any of you have worked in the industry, you've seen this. Shot peening, you basically blast it with BBs. It's literally like a, like a sand blaster. You fill it full of BBs and you blast your material. What that does is it, it dimples the surface, right? You dent it. And in doing this, you place this whole region under compression. But think about what we've been saying in this class, that cracks grow when? They grow when they're under tension, when they're being pulled apart. So if you put the surface under compression, then before it can grow under tension, it has to overcome that compressive force that's initially there. And so the net result is you strengthened it. You strengthened it because it's more likely to, to break under tension and you put it under compression, which works against tension. Um, you can do the same thing with uh, diffusive layers. You can case harden it. We'll talk more about that in a couple chapters when we get to diffusion. Okay. Um, now, environmental factors when it comes to fracture, the main thing is that you can generate a stress due to temperature differences, right? So a thermal stress, stress is that sigma there. The stress that we see is going to be equal to the difference in the thermal expansion. So that's delta AL, this guy right here, alpha L. That's the difference in thermal expansion between two materials. So again, let's imagine here that you've got two materials bonded together. You've got material A and material B, right? That's A, that's B. You super glue, those two, super glue those two things together, you weld them together, um, and then you start heating and cooling them. If they are different materials, then they're going to expand at different rates. Maybe A wants to expand a whole bunch, but e, B only wants to, wants to expand a little bit. Well, if B only wants to expand a little bit, but A wants to a lot, then in the end, what's going to happen is that B is going to have to stretch a little bit more than it wanted to, and A is going to have to stretch a little less than it wanted to. In other words, A is under compression, B is under tension. If B is a ceramic and you're putting it under tension, it's most likely to break in the B layer, right? Does that make sense? A, if it's a ceramic, since it's under compression, that's 10 to 15 times stronger, so it's less likely to be the one that breaks. Maybe it's a lot weaker material. It still might break, but it's going to be less likely because it's under compression. Um, e is the modulus of the material. That's the elastic modulus of the material that fractures. Um, well, of either material, you can calculate it in. And then delta T is the change in temperature, okay? So we will talk more about this a little bit later. Your thermal expansion coefficient, you remember that's given 
in the very, very first chapter we talked about it, it was PPM per K. That's the most common way to present it, PPM per K. Therefore, this is not a percent. It's like a percent, instead of divided by 100, it's dividing it by a million, but it has the units of per K. So when you multiply this by a temperature, you're going to end up with units of your elastic modulus, which is just the same as stress. It has the same units of stress. So that's how you get the units of stress out of this from thermal fatigue, as, say, day to night cycles do this. And this is pretty important. Um, this is why bridges are not pinned on, on both sides. If they were pinned on both sides, they would actually fracture when day to night cycles cause uh, slight uh, expansions and contractions of the bridge. That's why you have these expansion joints in bridges, right? They have a little bit of a gap so that when they need to expand and, and contract, they can do so without uh, putting lots and lots of stresses on the materials in the bridge. Okay. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is creep. Creep, as I said before, is time-dependent, permanent plastic deformation under a constant load. And you see this all the time. You probably just didn't know the word for it. If you have an old bookshelf, right, in your dorm or in your apartment where you're living, maybe you've seen that it's bowed like this. See how that's bowed? What happened is that when they initially put the books on this shelf, it didn't bow. That happened after years of them being there. And the books didn't get heavier over time. So what really happened is that this deformation happens really slowly. It's a slow process, okay? And it's permanent. If you take those books off, it's still going to be bowed. There might be a minor elastic response where something bounces back, but it's not going to be much, okay? Um, so creep occurs in stages. Just like crack growth occurs in stages, how fracture starts out with the crack starting to grow, and then it grows at the steady rate, and then it does something weird before breaking. Well, creep does the same thing. Creep starts out... And the strain that you observe, strain again being what? Strain is equal to, that's your, your deformation over time, like delta L, the change in length over your initial length. L final minus L initial divided by L initial, right? That's your strain. So the strain that occurs, it starts out growing really rapidly, and then it reaches this steady state region where it grows at a constant rate before it takes off uh, again before breaking, okay? Um, so there's different things happening in these different regions, right? In the first region, it starts out fast, but it starts to slow down. This is due to something called strain hardening, where basically as it deforms, it's putting things like dislocations, which we've only briefly talked about. We will talk lots more about those in the material. And the more and more of those that there are as it's deforming, the harder and harder it is for it to keep on deforming. And so it slows it down. That's why the rate is slowing down. Then you've got this region where it's constant. In that region, your strain hardening and what's called recovery are in competition with each other, and they're basically balanced. And then at the very end, you start getting sort of bigger flaws happening, like big cracks, internal cracks, or grain boundary changes, causing it to accelerate its deformation again before breaking. Okay. Now, because the secondary region is fairly long and it's linear, that's the most valuable thing for us to study as engineers because we can model that. Right? Being able to model that means we can predict it, and then you can design around it. Now, it is a function of lots of things. For example, low stress, medium stress, high stress. What do you think it's going to do? Of course, high stress is going to give you the most strain for a given amount of time. Low temperature, medium temperature, high temperature, you're going to get the same effect. Because as temperature is increased, the mechanisms of atoms being able to move past each other and get permanent deformation is also increased. So uh, you're going to follow that same trend, uh, low versus high. Increasing temperature or stress causes this thing to have higher strain rates. Okay. Now, we can quantify this, how much faster in terms of temperature and stress, with this expression. This expression, it has epsilon naught, sorry, epsilon dot, not naught. Epsilon dot, that means that it's a rate, right? It's epsilon dot equals the change in strain over time, right? It's the rate of the strain. That's why they call this the strain rate equation. So the strain rate equation is equal to K. K is going to be a constant multiplied by sigma. That's the stress applied raised to the n power. n is another constant for some material. Multiplied by the exponential of negative q. q is an activation energy divided by rt. Anytime you see in material science, we're, we're going to see this type of equation many, many times where there's always some property that you're predicting and it has some sort of constants out here, typically multiplied by an exponential of an activation energy, that negative Q, 
divided by RT, that's our thermal energy, we call this an Arrhenius style equation right here. Arrhenius style equation. Basically what this means is that because temperature is in the exponential, the higher the temperature, the property just takes off really dramatically. You can also get it to increase with sigma. As you increase sigma, it's also raised to an exponent, so it's also going to be a really strong influencer in this case. Okay? So here's what you can do, is you can take this expression, which is an exponential, it's not linear, but you can make it look linear. And the way that you do that is by plotting the natural log of the strain rate against 1 over temperature. So why does that give us um, linear behavior? We can do it just like before. Just like with the crack growth equation, we can make it look linear. If we start out by taking natural log of both sides, what do we get? We get that the natural log of our strain rate is going to be equal to, on the right-hand side, what did we have before? We had k sigma to the n. So that's going to be equal to natural log of k plus n times the natural log of sigma plus negative q over rt, right? Because the natural log of the exponential just equals 1, so it just goes away. So we can make this thing look linear. Why does this look linear? Well, think of how we're plotting it. We're plotting on the y-axis. We're plotting natural log of, oh, sorry, y-axis over here. Y-axis is natural log of strain rate. That's what this is. That's y. Meanwhile, on the x-axis, we're plotting 1 over t. Well, that's this guy right here, 1 over t. That's x. Therefore, the thing that uh, if it's y equals mx plus b, the slope is right there. And all of this would be your b. So y equals b plus mx, y equals mx plus b. Okay? So you can make this look linear. Or in other words, if I gave you a plot like this, you could read values off of it, calculate the slope. And from that, you could calculate negative q over r. r is the gas constant, 8.3144 joules per mole kelvin. So you could solve for the activation energy. This is really useful. There are examples of this on YouTube where I work this out. Okay? This is a really useful trick to be able to do to solve for your activation energy. Okay? Different materials will have different activation energies, right? Um, a low activation energy means a higher strain rate. Right? If you put a small number here, then it's going to be a higher strain rate over here. If you put a higher temperature here, it's going to be a higher strain rate. If you put a higher stress or a higher exponent here, all of these will increase the strain rate. Whereas if you have a really big activation energy, it's going to reduce it. Okay? So you can have different n values, and sometimes they've actually used those to associate them with different mechanisms of how creep occurs. Again, creep is permanent deformation, so the atoms are like sliding past one another, and they're staying there, right? That can happen different ways. You can have diffusion, which we will talk about in a few chapters, which is how atoms literally hop through the lattice. You can have diffusions of grain boundaries, of vacancies. We'll talk about those soon. Dislocation motion. We're going to be coming back to all these concepts later, but just realize that different exponent values can sometimes be used to estimate what type of mechanism was at play here, okay? Now, creep experiments, when you did this to your bookshelf, this took your entire college career, maybe. And so that's a really slow process. If you're an engineer, maybe you can't wait four or five years to figure out what the creep strain rate is. But that's still something that people need to know, right? When they build homes, you can see homes actually on, along their roofs get bent like that. So if you're going to live in your home for 50 years at least, you want to know what that roof is going to do. So we need a way to test for things faster. We can't just wait for them to happen over long periods of time. Well, what we can do is we can do accelerated testing. That means increasing one of two things. We're going to increase either temperature or the stress, right? That's what we can do in this equation. Our strain rate is proportional to stress and temperature, right? Now, once we figure out the activation energy by changing those things, we could hope that the same mechanism exists at different temperatures and different stresses, and therefore we'd be able to use it. Even though we determined it at these high rates, maybe it's the same mechanism, which allows us to predict it at these lower conditions. That's the idea behind this, okay? Uh, that's why you'll often see experiments like stress rupture curves. Maybe they'll take something and they'll pull it under tension, and it doesn't break. But then they put that sample in a furnace, right, at different temperatures. You've got T1, T2, T3, where T3 is the hottest. 
And then they just basically see how long it lasts before it maybe reaches some critical strain, which is too much, or maybe it, wait until it breaks. Depends on how they're defining failure. But in this case, whatever your stress is, T3, maybe it lasts you know, only, only one hour, or maybe it lasts 10 hours, right? But at lower temperatures, it would last much longer. Up here, for example, if it's up at this stress, T3 doesn't last at all, but T2 lasts this long, T1 lasts this long. You can generate these curves at different temperatures and then use them, okay? There's also something called the Larson-Miller parameter, which is just basically a better way of doing this. Larson-Miller parameter plots stress versus the Larson-Miller parameter. So what is the Larson-Miller parameter? It's typically equal to the temperature divided by 1,000, and the temperature needs to be in kelvins for these almost always, multiplied by A plus B natural log of T, where A and B would be materials constants you could figure out for a material, okay? So here's an example of one. For some family of materials, whatever this is, maybe some metal alloy, you can plot the stress. They did it in PSI, which is gross, barbarians. Plotting that on the y-axis on a log plot, see it goes from 1,000 up to 1,000. You can see that the, the spacings are not equal. It goes from 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then to 10,000, from 1 to 20,000. So that is a log plot up here. Then down here, here's your large miller parameter. And for this material, A is 36 and B is 0 0.78. What's really cool about this is you can then use this. You can say, okay, um, I'm going to load it at, say, 4,000 PSI. Okay? Therefore, my Larson-Miller parameter intersects this line right here at a Larson-Miller parameter value of, I don't know, call it 35 and a half. So you could plug in 35.5 and have that be equal to some temperature over 1,000 in Kelvin multiplied by 36 plus 0 0.78 natural log of T. And that needs to be in hours. That's typically how these things are defined, where temperature is in hours, right? Right here, temperature is in hours. So then I could say, okay, if the temperature is 400 Kelvin, you could plug that in, and I could be able to tell you, oh, it's going to last T number of hours. We could solve for T. Or I could say the other thing. I'd say I need it to last at least 600 hours. Plug that in here. What's the highest temperature it can go up to? See how useful this is? This is another really useful tool for predicting how things will behave. Let's do an example. For this example, we're going to say, what is the maximum stress in PSI for an iron chain to be used in a furnace for five years at 600 degrees Celsius? So we'll assume that this plot works for iron. Okay, I'm going to get rid of these. So if this plot is for iron, then we can go ahead and use it. The first thing we need to do is we're going to solve for stress, so we're going to need to get a Larson-Miller parameter. Well, we can get our Larson-Miller parameter. Lm, the Larson-Miller parameter, is equal to the temperature divided by 1,000. We need to put that into Kelvin, not Celsius. That's going to be multiplied by 36 plus 0 0.78 multiplied by the natural log of T, which needs to be in hours. So let's go ahead and start plugging this in. 600 degrees Celsius in Kelvin, that's 873 Kelvin. So 873 divided by 1,000 multiplied by 36 plus 0 0.78 times the natural log of, we need to turn five years into hours. So that's going to be five times 365. That turns it into days times that into 24 hours. Yep, that'll give us hours, okay? So when we plug all that in, we can see how it does. And I find that our Larson Miller parameter is 38.7, 38.7. So now we pull up this Larson Miller plot, right? 38.7, well, that would be 39 right there. Let me switch to red. If that's 39 right there, then 38.7 is just a little bit below it. We could try and read it accurately. But I'm getting that it would need to never exceed a stress of something like maybe call that 1,800 PSI. Your stress better be less than 1,800 PSI. Otherwise, it's not going to survive uh, according to this Larson Miller parameter. Okay? So again, there's some more examples of that on YouTube. But that is the rest of this chapter on failure. So we will pick up next class.
with chapter 3, where we'll talk about crystal structures. Now, one last point. On Friday, even though I won't be there, I strongly encourage you to come because there's some pretty nasty questions that we can ask with crack growth, right, with this differential equation that we showed you. Uh, where is it? Right here. Working with this thing, there's some pretty hard problems, and they're going to work through a hard one. And there's some pretty hard problems using this strain rate, this steady state creep strain rate. So I hope that you'll come to class on Friday. The TAs will work through some good examples. I think they'll help you out for the homework.